Hello, everybody. Welcome. We still have some people joining, so I'm just going to take a moment and let everyone in as they join. Uh, my name is Anna Gregoire, and I am the performance coordinator for Monroe Saturday Nights. I want to welcome you all to our wonderful poetry event. Uh, we do an annual poetry event every year, and it's always uh, a huge fan favorite. So thank you all for joining us in this slightly different one online. Uh, for those of you who are joining us from far away because we're doing things online, uh, Monroe Center for the Arts is an art center in Lexington. Um, and we have a program that's Monroe Saturday Nights, which is what we do. Um, and we really try to bring a stage to local artists and make performances accessible to everyone. Um, and one of the silver linings of this pandemic is that we're able to work with artists farther away. So that's why tonight we're bringing you really a wonderful array of poets. Um, our program does run on the donations that you all gave to us when you were uh, registering for this event. So we really wanna thank you. You are a huge part of the reason why we've been able to continue during this pandemic year. And um, it just, it means a lot to us. So thank you so much for your donation. Um, our next event that we're going to be doing is April 17th. It's a little different. We're going to be doing a round table uh, that's going to be a talk about creativity. And we're going to have artists, we're going to have some people in technology, some people in fashion, uh, just talking about creativity and how to find creativity in this time and different ways to bring creativity into your life. So if you're interested in that, that will be on our website shortly. Um, before we begin the performance tonight, I have a couple things that I need to chat to you about. Uh, one is that at the end of the performance, if we have time, we'll be doing a Q&A. So if you have any questions that strike your fancy during the reading, uh, shoot them into the text. I'll mark them down and we might ask the poets your question at the end of the evening. Um, also during the performance, if you love our poets, if you're interested in finding out more about them, I will be putting uh, information about them and where to find their books in the chat. Uh, if for some reason it gets lost in the chat and you can't see it, they'll still be on our website so you can go and find information about them there. Um, I really wanna take a moment to thank all of the poets that are gonna be a part of this this evening. Um, they really, they've gone above and beyond. They're really wonderful, wonderful folks who were so excited that they could join us online for this. And I also really want to thank Miss Cami Thomas, um, who is on our MSN board and helped put this entire event together. She's an amazing poet herself. And without her, there's no way this evening could have happened. Um, before I turn it over to Cami, who is going to host the rest of the evening for you, um, I would like to have a moment of observance. Um, in Lexington, where we're at uh, tonight, some of us, there was a visual for some of the horrific things that happened in Atlanta this week. And um, for people that couldn't attend that because they're attending our poetry event, I would really just like to take a moment to observe that. So if everyone just wants to take a moment with me and feel those things, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. I'm now going to turn it over to our wonderful Cami Thomas. Please enjoy our evening of poetry. Hi, everyone. I'm very glad that uh, you're here this evening. I want to thank Anna for putting this together with me. Uh, and I want to just make everybody feel very welcome. I'm going to read just a short introduction in between each poet. And then, uh, and then they'll be reading. So our first reader is Abigail Wender, a poet and translator. Her debut poetry collection, Reliquary, was published in February 2021 by Four Way Books. The Bureau of Past Management, her translation from the German of Iris Hanukkah's novel, is forthcoming in September 2021. 
She's a graduate of the MFA program for writing at Warren Wilson College and lives in Massachusetts and New York City. Abby. Hello, can you guys hear me? Okay, good, good. <clears throat> it's hard to remember to unmute. Thank you, Cami. And thank you for putting this reading together. Thank you to my fellow readers, Kristen, Reggie, Kazim, Ellen, and Martha. And thank you to friends who've come and family. Um, I'll just start in. Um, I did give some thought to the concept of transformation, which um, I hadn't really thought about that in terms of my work, but um, I, I did look at the poems through that lens a little bit. And what I can say is that uh, in the dictionary, one of the first um, definitions is that there's a complete metamorphosis. Well, as I was looking at my poems, I don't see that. I see um, forwards, backwards, sidewards <laughs> movement. <laughs> so um, it was an interesting lens to really think about change and how we, um, how we take change into us and, and how we feel about what our experiences. So I'll, I'll start and try not to talk too much. Um, Stone Lion. The lion at the family mausoleum lies still, mossy-backed and obedient. When no one watched, I wrote it. I never thought of those buried, only wanted to escape the living who were so easily offended. Our grandfather hated the place. When everyone you know is dead, you won't like it either. The lion stares from the cemetery bed. No one mounts the statue. It's silence that's offensive, banging up against the sky. Uh, this book has at its core a story about one of my brothers um, who was uh, for a very long, well, for much of his life um, addicted to opiates. And so I'll, I'll read this and I'll read a few poems from that core story and then some that are not um, so, so much part of that. Brother, because he can't tell his own story, may he never sleep another night in jail. May he never shiver heroin, sweat, flea bitten, rib broken. Because he forgot that we'd walked with our dog, may he never forget the blue spotted salamanders we found in muddy banks or how we swung by the rope into those rough waves. May he sing all night, dream of a sunflower woman. And let me not forgive, and let me not, and let me forgive him, brother and consolation, though he dealt me a bad hand and the price rose. Let me not forget him brother and sorrow, returned from prison those five years, engulfing him like a rubber suit, his cheerless eyes pondering me, my every fortune. Via Negativa. This time I won't think the sky is falling while riding the bus to Rikers Island. In the prison waiting room, no guard will touch my shoulder, say, why so scared? This time I won't be afraid, won't flinch, won't shudder. Cameras won't seek us clicking from every corner and he won't ask if I have it and I won't have it. Pressed into my sneaker, dope like me, closed in a yellow balloon. Barn Swallow. Shit streaks off the glass and the swallow shrieks from a near tree to see the eggs or the chicks, whichever's in the nest, on closer view, two nests side by side, how to keep close 
and away. So in this, I'm going to read a poem that um, takes us long, far, far away. Uh, my husband is from Sri Lanka. And after we got married, um, right after we got married, we went to Sri Lanka. And it was, as you'll see from the poem, the first time I was in that country. So this is a poem about that experience, Sri Lanka. Newly wedded, we borrowed two Schwins from the rest house and rode into the jungle. He hurried ahead on the road like a moon wandering a cold sky. I was in his country for the first time. He sped on, his white shirt aglow. I tried to ignore the young soldiers lifting their rifles, the monkeys in trees throwing stones, a water butterfly, a water butter buffalo turned its head as we passed, the reservoir where women wash their hair stone pillars elbowed from weeds and the sun flamed out. The bow tree we circled grown from a sapling of Buddha's tree, another transplant, was draped with flags, roots half buried by incense ash and lottery stubs. Hundreds of years ago, a monk carved these words on a rock to his beloved. Talk to me gently of your heart impenetrable. I seek you in the monk's arcane verse, the improbable evidence of things I long to see, like those who hold oil lamps to light the road. After image. My mother dies and I ignore the bulbs as they sprout in cold storage, anemic white stalks. Later, given dirt and light, an amaryllis chorus. Crimson ladies, red trumpet throats dissolving to black. Dear X chromosome, I have the sense we are alone. Found in ordinary cells, the extra X makes the woman, makes heart, breast, womb. Why, this, why there's all this space inside me, I don't know. Kidney, pancreas, stomach, spleen, our 100,000 miles of veins. Another universe unknown. It takes three days to reach our moon. Despite knowing we may be alone, my arms and legs outstretch, I keep trying to solve for X. Ancient mothers live inside this X. With all this space inside me, X chromosome, mothership, mitochondria live inside this X. Everything beautiful is far away and unknown. I own the ancient mother X, the message from my deep space repeats inside the rocket ship. What am I doing for time? Um, I'll read one more. Is that time wise, right? Okay. Translation. In English, we come to grief and drive drunk over a cliff, or it befalls us, a stroke or lightning, and we grieve. A famous translator said to her students, tend the fire. Every word born with its sphere of heat. Look up from your pages was another phrase she'd say, both at once, like riding a bike with no hands. At her desk, the translator wrapped a dictionary absently, searching for a pattern as she mourned her son's accidental death 
an absurd event. The heat searches for us. Last night, every leaf blew off the linden tree. This morning, it's filled with ravens flapping their jewel black wings, lifting off. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much, Abby. That was beautiful. And people, if you want to show appreciation, it's fine to put in the chat, not just questions for the poets, but if a spontaneous moment of praise is always nice too. So please feel free to put that in the chat. Um, our next reader is Ella, Ellen McCulloch Lovell, whose career intertwines art, civic organizations, and politics. She served most recently as interim director of the Vermont Studio Center. She's been president of Marlboro College, founding director of the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress, and deputy assistant to the president and advisor to the first lady in the Clinton administration. She has also served as chief of staff to Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont and executive director of the Vermont Arts Council. Janice Press just issued a new edition of her book, Gone. Poems have appeared most recently in JAMA and Green Mountains Review. She and her husband, Chris, live in Montpelier, Vermont. Ellen. Thank you, Cami, Anna, dear poets, everybody who's listening, and Claire Van Vliet, who designed the new edition of my book. When I pondered the theme for tonight, I thought of four kinds of transformation. I'll start with the political, where the public and the personal interact. Leaving. Leaving the Capitol in a yellow cab, no sleek sedan this time with driver uniformed, a helicopter's low tone turns me to see two white tops. I'll remember them always in tandem, the din, the whirl, ripped leaves and landing. I hugged my speech file to my blouse, held my hair down and watched him disembark with smart salute the groomed grass bending down, dog dashing out. What airline, the cabbie asks. I find a 20, haul my black bag out of the trunk and soon am looking out my oval window, glancing back. I once stood behind the door of the red room. And when the announcer known as the voice of God spoke, I switched on my lavalier and stepped onto the red carpet. The day before inaugurations dawning, damp, boxes packed for the archives, empty risers on Pennsylvania Avenue, tanned Texans in full length furs walk the blocked off street. I flash my blue pass, my six sided pin. It's the last day I can enter. We'll always let you in, the Secret Service guard lies, laughing. Hovering, huge, flown above the languid. <laughs> Hovering, huge, flown above the languid flags of the obelisk, low towards the big white house. Helicopters zero in. Men in black crouch on the flat roof. There goes the president. Tahrir Square. What's overhead? The helicopters, the photographers? Men hide in a bubble, bulletproofed, shoulder to shoulder, eyes obscured, black gloves on riot sticks and hold their line against the crowd. On the diagonal of the square, people squeeze against each other, heads flung, palms raised, screams bitten, Dark hair, no helmets, skin on thin skin, bin of body spilling towards the hard police. In the millisecond of the shutter in the middle of the lens, a triangle of metal helmets hits a row of fragile heads. Face framed, mouth shut, eyes on the eyes of the man with the stick is one red petaled heart, the woman in a red headscarf. 
the camera cannot see military men around a table who is missing. And is the summer palace ready? It can't see the nearby pyramids, their chim chambers empty, steady in the desert night. The machine of witness is selective and the camera's dead eye shoots the living lava of time-lapsed candles flowing around the stopped tank, gun turret pointing starward. A man on the rubble raises his arms against the fire sprayed night. Flags fly above the crowd, cries uttered at the barbed wire palace at the camera. Victory cheers stutter the night. God is great, not curses at the toppled. Children past bedtime wave tiny flags from car windows. Women's fingers part in V signs. Some are weeping. Solemn Suleiman has spoken, and Mubarak has fled to Sharm al-Sheikh. In camouflage, the men come crawling from tanks, embrace the stubbled ones outside, the busy air burst with bullets, with chants. At daybreak, broom handles swinging, blue-gloved women bend to their task again, sweeping, sweeping. The next have to do with that fragile passage between life and death, another kind of transformation. Mother's Potion. From the floor, the ceiling's a night without stars. The EMT's face strangely large when he leans down to ask, what day is it? Who's president? What potion did she drink so that objects around her continue to rise? The easy chair a foot higher, foam pads stacked underneath, a sign on the low sofa reads, do not sit on me. The shelf with wine glasses now far over her head, portions on the plate expand, giant sized. The phone slides further away, its buttons hard to push, Bedtime's lamp bends past her hand. I don't know the antidote or how someone this small even manages to fall, cracking her head hard enough to leak blood onto the white rug. Light on the stretcher, but I cannot lift her. Just as asleep on the sofa, I could not reach her. Oximetry. She's lost the manual, misplaced the map, tossed out directions. She's solo, no navigator, no trial in the simulator, rising, finding her zenith under her mask, her one task, to breathe. On her instrument panel, blue lines trace the contrails of breath. Green lines light up the soaring, diving heart. A trained team in the control room tracks her telemetry, how close the scorched sun, how near the wet earth. Her blue eyes closed, her wrists bruised, even her right earlobe is metered. A quiet machine beats red into her sleep. She wants ice chips, salve on her lips, but nothing else. No pillow, jello, music to dilute the whoosh of oxygen, and no extraordinary measures. Flying alone, she's breaking the barrier. She's so far away, we're not even specks. She asks one question only, why are you all watching me? Her daughters don't speak, don't dare ask our question. Is she landing or leaving? Then there is the theme of constantly changing nature. The betweenness of things. Just before the new year was due, things started to shake free. Stars from sky, trees from roots, rocks from ground, streams from sides, until the landscape looked both familiar and strange. 
even air and light moving in particles and waves began to change, quivering in the periphery of sight. Light slipped into darkened rooms and lit like butterflies on beds. Silent winds hurled circles of snow at windows. River water thickened over sunken rocks. Roadside cliffs heightened overnight. Their waters fell and froze green on granite walls. Night hardly receded, only scattered for a few hours, then settled in again. Air tasted like water, wind looked like stars, stars flew out of constellations and blew west. Trees slipped along ridge lines, then when eyes fixed them, stopped and stood still. Just beyond the body's limits, nothing stayed the same, but fled fugitive from Ken, except for persistent waiting, which senses the betweenness of things until they snap back into shapes and names in their grasp of necessary belief. Lastly, the transformation of the form of poetry itself. In this one, part of a series based on Psalms, I took verse six from Psalm 55 and wrote from it or wrote toward it using the golden shovel form Abby suggested to me. So each successive word of the verse is the last word of each line of the poem. Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. How often each day I want to utter an O, oh, either at tiresome sameness, or perhaps for that realization of the noticed, elusive bird I finally perceived that had no other meaning than itself, wings, imprinted on snow, where someone alighted like the protecting e eagle, underside imprinted or a gray speckled morning dove, more likely barred owl on the hunt, diving for a dangerous time, who then would catch his, clutch his catch on the wing, would listen sharply for the next kill, as I will, to hear what this hour tells, when to fly up, trusting the dove, or hunting away the night where I cannot be harmed and with others hidden in safe branches be close enough to one another at dusk where to find food, to find rest. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ellen. Fabulous. Next, we're going to hear from Kristen Hill, the author of How Her Spirit Got Out from Aforementioned Productions, which received the 2017 Jean Pedrick Chapbook Prize. Her work has been featured in the Academy of American Poets, Apt, Body, Boiler Magazine, Up the Staircase Quarterly, Muzzle, Pank, Tinderbox Poetry Journal, Winter Tangerine Review, and elsewhere. The recipient of the 2016 St. Batolph Club Foundation Emerging Artist Award and 2020 Mass Cultural Council Poetry Fellowship, she received her MFA in Poetry from UMass Boston, where she currently teaches. You can find out more about her work at www.kristenhill.com. Thank you so much, Kristen. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Um, firstly, I just want to thank all the organizers that made this event possible. You guys made this so easy during like a few difficult weeks. I can honestly say that. Um, and I also want to thank all the readers, Abigail and Ellen, your work is terrific and it's giving me a lot of courage to read maybe work that I was a little bit unsure about. Uh, for this reading. Um, can everybody hear me okay? 
Okay. Um, I I picked some poems. I've been I've been rereading Sister Outsider by Audre Lorde um, because this week I've just needed a Bible. Um, and so uh, Audre Lorde, uh, one of the essays that I often return to is the transformation of silence um, into language and action. So I tried to speak, I tried to pick some poems that speak to that. Um, and I'm just gonna read. Forgive her body. Forgive what remains when a dress is emptied. Forgive it in the blue dress. Forgive its fullness, filling the breath of doorway, always watching, warning you to keep your skinny behind away from the street. Forgive the gap that separates front teeth and lets a bit of tongue free when speaking. Forgive the bowl of belly that could not fill with child so it found you in a foster home in Texas. Forgive that your first craving was for arms, the way you ran to find them. Forgive the smell of left shoulder, forgive skin, the color of slightly browned pan dripped gravy, the light complexion that gave you away to strangers. Forgive hands that wielded steaming hot comb, fingers that rubbed on Vaseline when heat clipped your ears, fingers that threw cigarette butts into cold coffee, fingers that gave you alphabet, put pencil back in your hand told you to try your name again, forgive it when it is made of sweat and callous feet over time and another white lady telling it what it did wrong, forgive it at a desk making paychecks stretch for milk and bread and heat this month, forgive it singing Luther Vandross too loud in department stores, forgive it when it shrinks next to men, forgive it on its knees, forgive it when it is a busted vase on a living room floor, forgive that it is connected to mandible, to clavicle, to ribs connected to all things that break if hit hard enough. Forgive that it is often mistaken for something to be fucked or kept waiting. Forgive that you are always walking into the room of it, that you fill it with words, with dreaming. I'm going to try a new poem. Um, Also warning for um, sexual violence. So do what you need to to keep yourself safe um, if that comes up. Um, this poem is titled, Are We Still Good? This week, Trump's bloated name etched into the side of an endangered manatee. According to officials, it does not appear to be seriously injured. Someone in the comments says, obviously, it was just a joke. Calm down, liberals, and, part, and points to the part of the article where Trump's name was written in algae that had grown on the animal's back, not scratched into its skin. From what they could see, nothing was truly threatened. The manatee was probably too dumb and fat to feel anything. I think of all the ways cruelty begins as a joke until it chooses to finish what it started. The friend I'd known for years didn't stop when I asked and asked again. I thought maybe he didn't hear me. Later, he told a mutual friend that things just got out of hand. When asked if the story I told was true, he said, I thought she knew I was just playing. I remember when I was sure he heard. I recognized it was my fear that made him smile so loud. Still, I attempt to explain that surprise. At least I didn't die there, I tell myself. Even here, I wrote that as the first line of this poem and buried it. Anyways, he had work in the morning and offered to drive me home. I didn't have to walk back to my dorm in the snow. I laughed at everything he said on the way and tried not to let him see my hands shake when I took the gum he offered me. He asked, are we still good? I chewed my tongue, relieved that I could do anything else with my mouth until he parked, unlocked the door to let me out. I thanked him. I was so scared I didn't run.
I'm gonna read another new one. Um, this is from my Aunt Nita, um, who's always, who always fed me um, in her kitchen um, and in other ways too. So this is for Aunt Nita. Healing is not a clean kitchen. Here's another love letter. There are things I crave that have nothing to do with keeping me alive. When you were, you didn't tell me there would be a time I'd settle for having the heart of a strawberry instead of my wrist. That was Sunday. When I was little, you called me into your kitchen when you read my restlessness for hunger. Tuesday, I woke up hungover with nothing in a skillet. I carried a craving for fried potatoes only you could make out of a dream. I wanted to hear my name suspended in the melted fat of your voice. I tested the temperament of warming oil with a flick of flour like you taught me. Everything came alive again. You couldn't tell me there would be a time when I cried into my food this way. Um, one more poem, um, two more poems. I'm gonna do this one and then a really short one if that's okay. Um, this is inspired by Gwendolyn Brooks. Um, you'll recognize the title. I just changed it just a little bit, but this is called Girl Breaking Glass. And this is for Stefan Clark. Six of eight shots hit Stefan Clark's back. I tell everyone because that's how I feel. The fact a gutted deer in the sky, I wish it would rain. I tell the barista who just wants to ring up my coffee, the woman ringing, reading her phone on the train, I type it into my email subject line trying to send a message to my boss. I erase my subject line and try to correct my thoughts. There is no room for me to process police acquittals. I can't take the day off. I need to work to survive. My anger is displaced. I yell at my white neighbor when she tells me to calm down. I feel nothing when she cries, surrenders her hands to the threat in my voice. How easy to imagine my body a weapon I've never owned. I'm sick all the time. I can't shake this cough. I'm afraid to heal. I call myself stupid when I knock over my wine or forget my keys. I take in my sadness like a corpse holds water. My favorite place to cry is in public bathrooms. The black woman who shares the sink with me doesn't ask what's wrong when I come out of the stall, doesn't ask me where the why comes from when it drops like a blackened tooth from my mouth. She looks at our bodies in the mirror, reaches for me like my black mama only does in dreams now. She's the first person I let touch me all day. The smell of roses on her shoulder is a grace I don't know I need until I'm already on my knees. I'm gonna end with this one. Um, this speaks, I, I'm, I'm picking poems that are speaking to the writers before me um, and the readers before me. Um, and so um, I wanna, I'm, I'm gonna end with this one, Dangerous Things. I had a beautiful tree in my backyard and they cut it down. Dangerous Things. The tree in the backyard is dangerous, your landlord says, and must come down. You watch from your balcony when they start to take the whims away. Nests knitted to the branches tangled together on the lawn, the workers point out all they knew was rot its potential for damage. No one asks you, why would they? You don't know anything about trees. Don't even know what kind it is by its leaves. A week ago, this tree sur surprised you with flowers, white flags that smelled like your mama. Every time you walked out onto the back porch, you reached off the railing and clipped a piece, brought it back into the house. The flowers wept in the cramped heat of your kitchen, you should leave some things alone. Today, the workers are gentle with the nests. They cradle them before they bag them. 
You leave your house before it's done. The surviving birds louder than the chainsaws swooping and shitting on patio furniture. You come back to the abandoned sky and the red face of a clean cut stump. You think every violent gone belongs to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kristen. That was incredibly moving. Thank you. Our next reader is Reggie Gibson, who has lectured and performed widely in the United States, Cuba, and Europe. He's a Brother Thomas Fellow and has served as a consultant for the NEA and the Mere Distinction of Color a permanent exhibit at James Madison's Montpelier home. He has composed texts for the Boston City Singers, the Mystic Chorale, and the Handel and Haydn Society. He's the creator of the Shakespeare time-traveling speakeasy, a theatrical literary concert focusing on the life of William Shakespeare. He serves on the board of Grub Street and teaches at Clark University. And he's my neighbor in Lexington. <clears throat> Reggie. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cami. And thanks to everyone who's read so far and everyone who will, will read. Um, I don't know about everybody else, but I've been getting picked up, uplifted, and slammed um, tonight. And um, those are all good things, good th things to have happen. Um, first, when I told Cami I would do this, I was like, transformation. Good Lord, what am I going to? What do you mean, right? You know, but as usual, my mouth catches up to my brain later. So I said yes before I actually thought about what I might have. So, but as I as I started looking through uh, what I have and what I could write, I was like, wow, okay, there's there's a way to make this work. So what I'm going to try to do, it's going to take us way back. I'm going to project something, uh, and I want to see if people can can see it. Um, can you see that? Thumbs up if you can. Okay. This is um, from a, this is a, a photograph from Maureen Fahey. Um, she is um, a natural, you know, life photographer. And this is called um, Paradise in Death Valley. And so there was a project in which we were paired with, with an individual who was a painter or photographer and to do some research and some background on their work and, and, and the subject of their work and then to write something to it. So. Um, this is uh, something that I looked at, I fell into, and started listening to um, John Coltrane's A Love Supreme. And it wound up making its way in here, going into four segments. If you know Love Supreme, you know it's in four, four movements. So I won't call out necessarily the movements, but they'll be in there. You might hear them. And this is called A Precambrian Love Supreme. It's as if there is no sky yet as if this place is its own light, a light leading the now human toward the distant ink blue mouth where it has waited billions of years for the hapless accident of you to walk where your microbial ancestors once floated and swam, waited for your now human voice to vow open, bring back a bit of that turbid royal that carved it and echo along its escarpment and rise. Now, recall how the ancient floods would elide. Let this vision erode your primate mind like stone beneath the slow of Precambrian brine. Recall how this canyon was carved from water brought to earth by eons of trans-Neptunian comet and collide. Recall how this static metamorphic dance became marble moan of continental grind and groan. Now, shift to that Eucharist of stone, the unfettered angle and uplift, the swirl and rift of color, pearl patterned by the unrelent of turgid room caught now in geologic orbits, in limestone and sand, commanding a mosaic of archaean hues. Perhaps that is where the first stromatolite appeared after water shallowed and blue green beneath where cyanobacteria bedded down where thrumming shadows lie low. This place, 
is its own photo, unchanging, ever movement, static as dance. It summons the still not human in us to remember and reconcile with our bacterial beginnings, to remember how once we swam here, single-celled and seeking, driven onward by an instinct older than rock. I'll take that one away. And thinking about the subject of transformation, um, one of the things that, that I really love is, is opera. And uh, when, that's, when I look at films about opera, um, I just sort of get taken away by it. So it was a film I watched called, um, 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 it was called Farinelli. Uh, it, it was after this famous opera singer who was a castrato. And the castrati were, were, were young boys who had their, their um, who were castrated, that's the term castrato, so that their voices could be preserved. And, and these, these young men had sort of become rock stars as they grew up because their voice was somewhere in between uh, caught in that space in between becoming man and, and caught in a, a place where people felt it was androgynous. And so it was rumored that there were also serf, several popes who kept uh, castrati um, to sing to them and sometimes to sing them to sleep. But they, as you understand, these young men, they suffered a life filled with pain. And so they would, they would get opium and they would go into these fever dreams. And, and, and so uh, some of their dreams were recorded. And this is, um, this is called The Castrato Speaks after the film Farinelli il Castrato. Gelding gallops thunder my temples. Black hooves gouge the brain beneath my brain. Horse heads oblong turn toward my hairless song, pubescent throat ambered at the cusp of change. Because it drags the purgatory between boy and man, the church cloisters this choir in my voice. God needs it to remain cherubic, a flaccid halo around the Holy Father's head. It would seem my mouth swells the cock of Trinity and paints women in wet alleluia when they think of my lips becoming hips, becoming lips again, becoming a fetished verb inside them like hard fruit they squeeze between their fat legs while their husbands sleep. I am lace and powder and powdered wig. I am satin and sound and sounded. I am the angel's androgyny, the hour of failed flesh, the absence of apples in winter. I am the absence. Opium once offered beatific delirium. I'd lift a goblet to Morpheus, he'd slide me a dream. But even he has grown impotent and can only offer reprise of nightmare. Ambered cusp of turn, my throat pubescent, hairless, hooves oblong into black gouge beneath my brain, my temples thunder like geldings recalling stallion fire, recalling time before two moons hanging in hanged night were lynched slow through earth's shadow, before my voice stayed lifted as a fisted scalpel, lifted like the round backsides of aristocratic daughters, lithe, lilac, clandestine in their sex, the small fragment of the infinite asleep in their bellies, aroused by the horror I am inspire castrato i awaken floating in the o of that word a whiteness an encircled empty the stillness sanguine flaccid weeping its withered rage between these yellow thighs um i will go with maybe a couple of more and then get out of your way um, this is, I guess, where I was probably most transformed. And um, it is a piece that I wrote a while ago. It was for my daughter, or about my daughter, um, one of my daughters. Her name is Safia. And um, her mom is from Germany. And when she was born, her mom and I, we had broken up and gone through a lot of horrible, terrible stuff together. And uh, mainly because I guess we couldn't get out of our demons, but it was, it was me traveling around. And um, at this point, I wanted my daughter, Safia, to know that it wasn't always sort of painful between us. So um, 
This was sort of written after the Chinese calendar of in the year of something. And so this is um, in the year I loved your mother. In the year I loved your mother, I lived a glorious death. I was satellite traveling between blood and star, a planet evolving through rage and grief. That year I loved your mother came the time of drought and deluge, a season of ruin and rain. Between us was much soil and water and a literate ocean of language and diction. I arrived to your mother half broken, half breaking. In the year I loved your mother, we were drum and drone, a volley of polemic and ideal. Once, once I glimpsed you, you were waving at me from her mouth. As dawn met our shoulders, she whispered me your name, and we became the thin line between sea and mountain, between valley and sky. In the year I loved your mother, gravity abandoned me to her. She was a vortex, a black hole sewn into the belly of a continent, crushing all into one glorious singularity. Grape was, wine was, sound was, song was, motion was, dance was, dove was, vulture was, circling was, landing was. All that was, was her. In the year I loved your mother, it was the year of tragedy, and tongue. We severed ours, stitched them into one another's mouths. This is how we grew fluent in speaking pain. We brought stones from our pockets that year, traded them, hurled them back towards each other's wounds, and those that missed were gathered later, one by one, were used to build these walls. Your mother was an equinox of razors when I found her. An autumn of featherless wings caught in this traveling gale of a man. Your mother was soft lips cutting calluses from my knuckles. She was a silk fist lodged hard in my mouth, opening into a sunflower widening in the crag of my throat. And in her skin, I was a cryptic blasphemy, transparent, decoded, holy. And um, the last piece I'll read is a piece that I'm uh, put some music to. I'm going to be doing in a performance that I'm doing next week or something called Latitudes. It's going to be March uh, 25th, next week, Thursday. And um, the, the name of the, the performance is called Here Among the Americans. And it is, um, uh, it is basically spined or contexted by, by Robert Hayden's American Journal of an alien who comes to the United States and, and is somehow drawn to the Americans. And, and so that's part of it. And it's a, it's a whole bunch of new stuff for me. So this is a piece that's in it. And it was for me a transformational time in American history, uh, one that I wish we were sort of still transformed by. And it is the time of what I hope we can maybe take now from the time of the transcendentalists, Henry David Thoreau and Ralph Waldo Emerson. Henry Thoreau told civilization, yo, I gotta go, baby, I needs a vacation. So he headed out to Walden, whereupon he copped this revelation. Whoa, so many of us live lives of quiet desperation. Lo and behold, another old quotation seems to capture the essence of a modern vexation. It's as if Thoreau knew that in the future, you and I would need to act in radical ways to mitigate the sad fact that because we've got to slave to keep these bills paid, Sometimes it seems our minds are kind of ripe to get played by the vultures in our culture who are hoping to withhold us from anything any deeper than work while we scold you, buy what we told you, pay what you owe, uh, and we'll ensure you've got a debt you'll never get over. Soldier, treating human beings like we're merely skin machines where the cash is, some sick ass profiteers demographics, puppets made of plastic, molded, mastered, stretched thin as thread till we're bled dead into our caskets. Yes, we try to contrast it by coming off sarcastic, hating the situation we face it because we find it so drastic. Many of us huff, puff, snort, and drink all kinds of stuff to get blasted, hoping to deaden the pain of our constantly kicked asses. 
But when we come down, we tend to find that action makes the masses want to act a bit more passive keeping their minds inactive to the plans of all those fascists who want to keep you and me separated by races and genders and classes, because I mean, shit, man, that's the way you maintain the status quo status as is. But don't let them head fake you. Shake and bake and back, break you down to the ground, come around, clown and undertake you. You got to fight back. My advice is use whatever thing of beauty you got trapped inside of you as a shield and a weapon. Do you dig? Do you dig? Ralph Waldo Emerson was that brilliant thinker and decidedly was the dawn amongst New England transcendentalists. He said we should all become self-reliant existentialists, which means we should rely upon our very own experience and not accept all these preconceptions we've inherited like racial, cultural, social, gender, and sexual, and all these other kinds of prejudice. He said we should beware of demagogic fundamentalists. Check out the way Ralph Waldo kicked that 19th century rhetoric. He said, to be yourself in a world that demands you become someone else is the greatest accomplishment. Be patient with yourself. Every great artist was once an amateur and your character is worth more than your intellect. For every minute you spend being angry about something, you gonna lose 60 seconds worth of happiness. But the goal of life is not necessarily to be happy, but to be useful and have your life make some kind of difference. Now, it ain't going to be easy for any of us to do any of this. At some point in time, we're all going to find we got to make some mental shift into a higher way of thinking and a vaster, broader consciousness. Listen to the voice within, you know, the one that insists that we love, play, chant, meditate, and then dance, you Sometimes you got to learn to let go and take a chance on becoming something other than you've been convinced you can be. I'm talking real human beings, not these human being things. I know the world can be an enemy whose mission be to empty us of empathy, intelligence, and energy. Come around, beat us down, destroy our last breath, make us want to give up that last breath. But we can't let them head fake us, shake and make and back, break us down to the ground, come around, clown and undertake us. We got to fight back, y'all. My advice is let us all use whatever poetry and music or transformational thing of beauty we've got trapped inside of us as both a shield and a weapon. Do you dig? Dig. Thank you. Thank you so much, Reggie. That was great. Next. Oh, and just a reminder, if anybody has questions for any of the readers, please do put them in the chat. That would be great. Thank you. Next is Martha Rhodes, author of five collections of poetry, most recently The Thin Wall from the University of Pittsburgh Press. She teaches at the MFA Program for Writers at Warren Wilson College and is the director of Four Way Books. Martha. Thank you so much. Um, what a pleasure and thank you to the organizers and um, everyone that's attending. Okay. I'm gonna read from a manuscript that's in progress, uh, tentatively called from the, from the Banished Ones. Unsoft. From the beginning, that was only my beginning. I don't presume it was anyone else's. I was difficult. No one came forward to nurse or clean me. Ashamed to look away, they could not look at. For I was, if not horned and befouled, repugnant. Reminding them of the ever suppressed collective nightmare. Even in their most naked moments, barely awake, before coffee and eggs, dawn just beginning to melt the crust at their eyes, they heard my squalls and pretended I was yet to arrive into their lives. I was still just a swelling for those moments, a happy promise. From the beginning, I was demanding and insatiable. I ate through carpet, pearls, 
quilts and pets. I demolished bank accounts and shat out snakeheads. I was, I remember, a beast, unsoft, rancid, my milk teeth pointing in all directions. I was at home in their root cellar, hayloft, dung pile, pig slot bucket, called scarecrow, gaseous fungal spread. I am not self-loathing, mind you, and I do not ask to be convinced otherwise. My sister knew I belonged townships away at the lodge. Send it to the lodge, she'd pray through her sheets. But I'd made that impossible, having crawled through the portal of that place to smear my waist on those walls and across the sleeping foreheads of its occupants. You see, I wanted to stay with my family, my loved ones. If only it wasn't so difficult to smother a difficulty, I'd hear through my crib's paddings. So I tried to make it easy for them. I rose up again and again to meet the pillows held above my head. How sad. Their kisses were bitterly thin, their lovemaking so dry, blisters erupted. To lure her, he coated and dusted himself with sweetness of any form. But only bears, ants, and bees circled him. Bears, ants, gnats, bees, all the universe's creatures attached to his skin, save her. Neighborly. We invited them over from their fields to ours to join us naked and playful, to give them hope, to watch us joyfully trample our own lands and witness the greening anew overnight. Our fields paid for, no mortgages. To join us in and outside of our tents of celebration and share our jungles and waterfalls. But when we woke, nothing. Even the tents while we slumbered, gone. Our dogs, our shoes. To reclaim. Our just appointed soldiers followed the Charles from Millis to Needham in search. We follow them as scouts. Our dogs strewn on the wayside, shot and gutted. A scarf some recognize as their own, no other clues. I wish to go away from life today. Join the dogs rotting, everything hurtling sideways away from and at me. One of us ahead yells, look, and I peer into a ditch, my nudist leavings of stars still fuming, skittering, and I know I can begin again, but will I? Out of sorts, Rondo. What's in the air? What's stalking me that wasn't there until at three, just as the wind picked up that barn and settled it onto another's farm? Or did I dream this malevolency? Admittedly, I'm out of sorts, and all this week I've wanted to lash out at those who speak as if there's nothing. Don't be alarmed, it's a gentle day. You won't be harmed. It's in your mind, you're never happy. Those who know nothing say that to me. There's an evil out there, the air's no balm. Stop trying to soothe me, I won't be calmed. A gentle day, I won't be harmed.
banishment. From the house, barely, nakedly, burningly driven into pasture beyond. Bad daughter, thrown across acres without even a mother's shawls and pillows. Where to sleep, where hopping things won't hop and nest in her hair. Why thrown out? Why not him too? All we did was kiss, a small shallow kiss. Now he drives by without a glance, years of driving by, watering the fields with his spit. And she dressed in corn husks and pointing east, arms pointing east, west for all, even the crows to scoff at her ragged, pathetic self. inconsolable. Oh, my mother, I hear your dinner bell. I collapse at your door, hungry, alone, locked out and breathless from that relentless pressure of these parentheses. Scorned. So she will wear the field as a shawl. She will haul the swords leavings to the river back and forth under sun and moon, the entire town dumping trash and curses upon her. Recurrent. I was afraid of the cave's airiness, bats beating the currents hot, the tide pushed up against us, fish bombarded my knees and thighs, no shelf for me to lift up to, every kind of fish imaginable. You know my aversion to them, worse my terror, the shiny, wet, scaly, scaly eye-popping, mouth-opened, leaping out of the water at me fish, and the deepening brine absolutely teemed with them, their sharp teeth glaring. I counted every one with my eyes closed. I told myself, they are only an inch long. They are oblivious to you. You will survive this, this episode. That's all it is. The others are not afraid, so why are you? They're even enjoying the swim. Think, why are you so afraid? What sludgy hideousness happened to you to make you this afraid? Oh, it doesn't matter, swim, grow up. But then frogs entered the pool and the water boiled thick with them. 50 exactly landed on my head all at once. You must remember, don't you, my aversion to them? their croaking, their green sliminess, their ability to jump, land, slide, and land again. So of course there were frogs in the up to my neck by now pool. All other things wet dove in, an explosion of wetness. You also entered, trillions of you upon my shoulders, between my legs, spawning in my ears. How to bear this one more second knowing it was only the beginning of the pool's beginning and me in it. Embraced. I have visited an ancient redwood and heard it creak as I've rested my cheek and ear against its trunk. It has received my deepest sobs and my hundreds of fingerings along its soft bark. Leaning into it, I've whispered to my most darling ones, mother, Lucy, my multicolored cats, as if they've coursed through the tree's vascular system to form an inner pool, their happy noise so audible. I've stopped at the tree for hours over years in the shadow of Mount Tam, and I have napped at tree's base, inebriated 
by the moldy brew of its memories, boiled up to commingle with the mist of my breathings of nose, mouth, and cells, so that I must slow, resist rushing past, to recall the paddings of creatures before me as well as my own over years. I always like to pretend the tree has fashioned a thick, fresh bed of fallen needles, especially for me. Today, as I walk the loop around Bon Tempe Lake, I hear the loud and familiar hello from the tree. It's creek long, bent like, and old. I know the tree has ushered me back to remind me that it has, in particular, missed me. The tree wants to know where I've been these past 11 years and where I wish to go and where I think I will go. Thank you, thank you very much. That was gorgeous, Martha, thank you. Our final reader tonight is Kazem Ali who was born in the United Kingdom and has lived in the United States, Canada, India, France, and the Middle East. His books encompass multiple genres, including several volumes of poetry, novels, and translations. He's currently a professor of literature at the University of California, San Diego. His newest books are a volume of three long poems entitled The Voice of Sheila Chandra and a memoir of his Canadian childhood Northern Light, Power, Land, and the Memory of Water. Kazim. Thank you, Cami. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's good to be here with you. I'm going to open up with a poem that is not in any book. It's called Pulse. And I wrote it in the summer of 2016. To the sharp report in the dark, the season comes home. The long tongue sound between hand and arm, between mouth and flesh. Hold this moment river still. What if it was my life? To return after years to the same province of danger. An old town you know as familiar as the handle, the bump stock, the trigger. I want to return to the boat that bore me here from the far shore decades ago. What I lived in those languages, I forgot. The places I left, I want to return to. Were we seen? Were we spoken? Were all the wolves baying for our blood? met at the edge of the bright darkness of rain. Time cannot fulfill its promise to splinter, return, or slow. Vow, this wheel, this we, will this wheel we even wean we in the world, would wool the low vow fold, worn low at the hip, to be a solid soldier who soiled his sold soul for the chance to be the first to aim, first to fire, first to fly in the crosshairs. I am heir to no oar to hold. I am, in this case, on both sides of the gun, told as sound or cost, one that never ends and the other never returns. Any embrace is the first error in meaning's slope wrought by thought that one could reach another, touch his shape. Known in two genders, like Orlando, whose tongue newly woke to pronounce any word for God or man, means to enter violence's fold. No oath sworn now to save, I have no salvation, no salve, no valor, no ovation, no nation.
So that was Pulse. This is a poem called Advice Column. It's an actual, I mean, I imagined it was an, adv an advice column. It's a real person who posted a question on the internet, which I thought was very dear and ridiculous. Advice column. Falak in Corpus Christi, whose name means dawn and whose hometown means the body of Christ, wants to know if the soul has a gender. I am the sun thrown down, the thorned down sun who drowned, shorn the sun's sound, who spoke noon, sun, mouth, speak, me, always untorn and enslaved, these weird notions of gender and ground, nothing but you between me and God. So I whisper to all the bonded women whose names mean sunrise or wind, what sweetness it is to call the bluffs of those men who say they know what's on God's mind. Um, this is a little poem called Golden Boy. I think it's my, it's, it is also not in any book. None of these poems are in any books. <laughs> they're all, they're old poems though. I mean, they're not, this is not, these are not new poems that I'm working on. Um, so this poem is, is like my Ars Poetica. I think it should be in a book at some point. It's called Golden Boy. The golden boy is a statue on top of the Manitoba parliament. And I grew up in Manitoba. Almost afraid I am in the annals of history to speak and by speaking be seen by man or God. Such then debt in light be paid atop the Manitoban parliament building in Winnipeg, what beacon to dollars, food or God shines. I hallow starvation, this nation beneath the body, hollowing its stomach to emptiness and in breath, the river empties. Who so spoke the craft born along long echo and echelon, grains of light and space, we with one another wait the soul, not the spirit, went or wend, why true, we've woe, we've woven a dozen attempts, these tents pitched on the depth be made, biped by pan may perch atop the temple pool, proven the proven, these riches, wheat and cherries and prunes, and what washes over woven ocean, frayed, I am most Sir, desired, sired in wind, seared and worn, once in wild umiak sworn. We parley to mend, be conned, be bent, come now called to document your meant intent, your indented mind, and haul, O oh star, your weight in eons, there in paper, money, morrow, more you owe, and over time, God spends the spent river, melted into summer sound, out the window, sound out the spender. Where does the river road end? And in what language can prayer or commerce be offered? Ender of senses, pensive atop plural spires, be spoken or mended, broken and meant for splendor, my mentor. Um, so I'm looking at my time. Okay, this is a short little tiny little poem. Miss Cami Thomas, the brilliant poet who's brought us together today. Um, our, our books, we had two books come out in the same year and someone sent me her book. This was Cathedral of Wish. And if you know that book, they're full of these tiny little poems, but they're like switchblades, you know? So this is a tiny little poem that I wrote. It's called Fox Week and there's a transformation in it. So it goes according to the theme as well. Fox Week, two wounded foxes linger in our yard. Only once in my life have I ever asked God to answer me, but this time I think I am a fox in the yard who needs no answer. I remember nothing of how I was wounded, 
so I must be at home. Um, I'm going to also read, uh, so I'm going to read two more poems to you. I'm going to read a poem since Gwendolyn Brooks came up like multiple times. <laughs> I'm going to read you a poem that um, it's ostensibly a golden shovel. And this is the quote. It's from Gwendolyn Brooks's novel, Maud Martha. But the sun was shining and some of the people in the world had been left alive. And it was doubtful whether the ridiculousness of man would ever completely succeed in destroying the world. So I hold on to that. Hope, I hope it is doubtful whether the ridiculousness of man <laughs> will succeed. So, and so I sow the night to the whore I sun, are the sun, but the sun records each sin that since was seen, was shy, was shining. There, sun to some and some that swam, each sing to sun to sunder, and some I sold to sell these cells that full cosine I quell. And of the people called, they killed myself a lie, ally, or lined my cell in the world. No matter that hurt, I heard what killed a calc. Ululation had been left unheard, unaccounted for, uncounted in the ledge for which God's book thrust lies alive, and it was then deader, that shelter, dreadful weather, and again sounded out and spied, doubtful whether we could found, as unfound citizens knew loss, these laws, based upon the ridiculousness of man. So I then in wood and thatch, natural swatch and shook seed pleats would ever completely succeed. Loose and swore, sure sand to shore, enlightening, unstoried, stored in destroying the stories vaulted, fault lines assaulted, do lie untoward still on this sword, this sward, this sun one world. So that is from my book, Inquisition. That's actually from a book. That's the one poem I read to you that's from a book. And I wanna close with this weird little poem. Now I haven't read this poem to anyone before, but um, in my book, Skyward, which came out not quite 10 years ago, um, there's a strand that runs through the whole book that's Icarus, young Icarus, the boy. Um, but of course I could not allow Icarus to drown. So in my book, he pops up at the end and he treads water and then he's, he makes it to shore basically. Um, but then we leave him there. And uh, so this poem is called Icarus Turns 50. And it's a very different in tone from everything else I've read to you tonight. I'll just, I'll, I'll just say that and I'll read it to you. Icarus Turns 50. Crudite and crackers. That's how this myth starts. I'm slicing cucumbers when the phone rings with that ominous tone of a call you're not expecting. It's happened, I think. He's gone. And I wasn't there. And we didn't talk before it happened. And then comes his voice, alive and unbothered, same as it was, maybe a tiny bit more gravelly. And haven't I imagined this moment 108 times before, once for each turn in that Minoan maze, once for each feather individually affixed to my back? Sometimes when I imagine this moment, I'm silent and wait for him to speak. Sometimes I hang up. Sometimes I'm angry. Sometimes I start crying. But in none of them do I do what I do now, which is respond conversationally as if it hasn't been decades since the labyrinth. Dad, it's been a lifetime since I entered the blue deep, since choking to the surface, treading water and scanning the thudding horizon for whatever rescue by bird or boat I thought would come that did not come. Perhaps it's not surprising that I grew up ordinary, the son of a great genius, a once rash, once lad who dared everything to feel fire, to be exceptional, to reach the sun, to see what fish flickered beneath the dark surface. As for him, he begins in the middle of a sentence like he always did, talking about the virus and grocery delivery and what's happening with my cousin's youngest son, 
who's decided to drop out of college and become a DJ. And just like that, I feel the vibration of his voice banishing the old story, denying all my anger and my sadness of the decades since I crawled onto the rocks from the sea, weeping through my salt raw throat. What is there to say? I ask him what he shopped for and he says they don't have Weetabix anymore and he drinks almond milk now and the life where I flew away from him and he let me go just winks out when a new life starts unraveling in his place. So for us, there's no epic end. There's no begging the king of the underworld to return the lost son. There is no father casting himself grief stricken into the sea. Instead, we talk about Weetabix. He asks, are the cucumbers organic? And did I know they have vegan cheese now? And where did I get those delicious rice crackers? This is what we can bear. This is the price that we're both willing to pay. Thank you. Thank you, Kazem. That was absolutely gorgeous. So musical. Thank you everyone so much for reading. I feel I've been on a huge linguistic voyage among other things and I couldn't have imagined the different kinds of transformation you were all going to talk about. So I'm deeply, deeply grateful to all of you and I feel honored to have heard all of that. Thank you a zillion times. Another round of applause for everyone. Thank you. And I'll turn it over back over to Anna now to close it out for tonight. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to thank Hammy again for just being the linchpin of this process and bringing everyone together um, and doing hours of work to make this happen. I, I want to thank the readers so much. That was a beautiful evening. Um, thank you for your vulnerability and your honesty. And I personally, I think that's the most connected in an online performance that I've felt. And it gives me the feeling that, that we're on, you know, we can see the end of this. We're at the horizon of this and there is connection and it was beautiful. Um, thank you for everyone who tuned in and thank you to everyone who donated. Um, because of you, we can continue bringing performances like this. Uh, and it's for you that we do it. So thank you to everyone again. I hope everyone has an amazing evening. And uh, we will see you next time. Good night.